Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Lars Schall. I am an independent financial journalist from Germany and I am now connected in Berkeley, California with Peter Dale Scott, who is a former Canadian diplomat and a former professor for English. And moreover, he is a political researcher and poet. Hi Peter. Hello Lars, good to talk to you again. Thank you very much for being available. Peter, um, we decided to talk this time about the deep state and the first question I would like to ask you is why would you say it's still relevant to talk about 9-11? Well, 9-11 um, was the occasion for major changes uh, both in American foreign policy, it's, it's the reason why we went almost immediately into Afghanistan, and it's also why we began planning almost immediately to invade Iraq, which was uh, based on the false assumption that uh, Saddam Hussein had some connection with al-Qaeda. There had been evidence provided, it was false evidence, but the uh, administration chose to believe it. From an American point of view, the changes in foreign policy are perhaps not as serious as the implementation on that day of what we call continuity of government procedures, which has uh, radically altered the status of the American Constitution in this country. They have been planning uh, for 20 years what to do in the case of a major emergency like 9-11, and the plans were uh, worked on for two decades by Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney, who were also the two men who implemented them on 9-11. And uh, we don't know in detail the plans, but I think we can safely sum them up under three headings. Warrantless surveillance, that's what Edward Snowden has uh, proved beyond the shadow of a doubt, that it's, it's massive in the country, and it's because of this uh, COG uh, authorization, warrantless detention. We had a, more than a thousand Muslims rounded up without a warrant and held. Uh, we have something called habeas corpus in our in our common law. Uh, you're not supposed to hold people for very long without charging them. They, they more than a thousand people were not charged. Some of them were tortured. Uh, that is a huge, huge change in the domestic condition of America. And then finally, um, the involvement of the military in uh, what we call now homeland security, let the military play a police role. And that too is something new. I mean, you would occasionally have the army called in to deal with a crisis like uh, the um, rioting in the inner cities in the 1960s. But um, to have a permanent army command for North America, that's called NORTHCOM, that's very new and it's a, it's, a, it's a radical change in the role of the army. And above all, this is why I talk about a deep state. We now have institutions which are able to operate in America without being controlled by the American Constitution. I don't see how you could have a more radical change than that. What is the deep state? What are deep events? And what has 9-11 to do with both? Well, uh, let me give somebody else's uh, definition of the deep state. A Washington Post reporter called Dana Priest wrote a book, Top Secret America. And in it, she said, we now have two governments, the one its citizens are familiar with, operated more or less in the open, the other a parallel top secret government whose parts had mushroomed in less than a decade into a gigantic sprawling universe of its own. Well, in a sense, that uh, second level, the deep state level, has been uh, growing over decades. But it is true that it has mushroomed in the last decade when she was writing, and exactly because of 9-11 and the changes which were authorized, implemented, uh, before the last of the four planes had gone down. They had implemented COG, then they proclaimed an emergency three days later, and we've been living in this state of emergency, which means that, in effect, the, uh, the Constitution does not rule the way it used to. Now, you asked about deep events. 
uh, 9-11, I call a deep event, because uh, from the very beginning, it wasn't clear exactly what happened. We, uh, the, the, the journalists commented on the confusion and the inaccuracy of reports. It became so bad that Congress had to press. It was, it, it, it was a fight to get an investigation. This is the largest criminal act that was ever committed in America, and the, the White House tried to uh, ignore it. They, there was a crime scene that was dismantled almost immediately. Some people would say that was illegal. They, they said they were looking for corpses, so that's why they carried away all the steel. But now scientists are very interested to know uh, what residues there were in that steel to see if the buildings were perhaps blown up or not. Most of the steel was shipped out of the country very quickly. And um, so it's a deep event. And we had uh, then a commission. The, the two great events that are deep events are first the Kennedy assassination, 64, 63, then uh, uh, 9 11. There are more. Some of them are, can be very small. You know, I think I've had some deep events in my personal life. I write about one of them in the American War Machine. But the ones which had constitutional consequences were the Kennedy assassination. The consequences were pretty invisible in that one, but they were real. It changed the role of the CIA and its relationship to the FBI and to local police. Uh, much more important were the changes after 9-11. Just take the one that uh, Edward Snowden has so completely documented, warrantless surveillance. That, I think, of the th big three is perhaps the least important, of, but it's the only one that we're really talking about in this country. Um, and in both cases, you had commissions to investigate, and they came out with findings which were demonstrably not true. Now, that's the real test of a, of a big, deep event when they investigate it and they give you a story which almost immediately people can start picking holes in and see is not true. So my definition of a deep event is one which, an event which we are not given the truth about and uh, in, in the biggest ones we are given a story which may be true in, cer in certain respects but in key respects is not true. One thing you're looking at in your work are patterns that were common both in 9-11 and the JFK assassination. First of all, when did you discover this phenomenon and what did you feel about it? I, I pretty soon after 9-11 I was struck by the fact that they knew almost immediately who, the who, who had done it. You know, the, um, Richard Clark's book, uh, he, he was a, in a position of authority, and he says that the FBI had a list of the hijackers of the planes before 10 o'clock on that day, and that also is before the last of the planes had gone down. Well, for anyone who knows uh, anything about the Kennedy assassination, uh, one of the things that has never been explained is how they were broadcasting on the police tape a description of the uh, perpetrator, the man who had shot uh, Kennedy allegedly from a window, and they gave, they gave a, a, a pretty descri accurate description, I mean, a precise description, five foot 10, 165 pounds, and they could never explain where that uh, description came from. And they allegedly, they attributed it to a man called Howard Brennan down below, but he would only have seen the top half of the man in the window. So how would he know five foot 10, 165 pounds? The interesting thing is that was the description of Lee Harvey Oswald in his FBI file and in his CIA file, even though it was not true. Uh, they were broadcasting a, f a description of the perpetrator within 15 minutes that had uh, been taken, and when I say broadcast, on the police tape, that had been taken from the FBI file and the CIA file, and the FBI has never been able to really to explain 
Nobody has been able to explain how that was done from the government side, and the same has proved to be true with 9-11. In fact, you know, they broadcast the description, uh, but again, I'm saying internally, they circulated a list of um, the hijackers, and there were two names on that list that later got hastily dropped, because one of them was dead, and the other one, I think, was not in the country, not, certainly not on an airplane. Uh, it was a list I think they took out of files. And that's just the first of about, uh, that's the first similarity between these two deep events. Uh, in my book, The War Conspiracy, I have more than a dozen, and I've been adding to that list myself. Uh, the, the modus operandi. The, the other thing is that these people, uh, lay, they laid a per, paper trail. Oswald um, kept a diary and he did all kinds of things which were later used to incriminate him, although he was, of course, dead. And uh, the, at Logan Airport, the uh, Mohammed Atta and his friends, they left a car that was filled with evidence. Um, though that was very convenient for the FBI that the perpetrators, or what I call the designated culprits, because it was clearly decided in advance who, who was going to be blamed for this, and they had these people who actually help document the case against themselves. I could go on and on. I don't know if that's enough for you. Well, I would like to ask you um, about specific communication channels that were involved both in JFK and in 9-11. Uh, why is it um, perhaps the most important similarity? Well, yes, uh, I believe <coughs> that uh, the uh, national communications network, it has had different names over the year, but it's, it's the special network that was set up in connection with continuity of government planning and it goes back to the 1950s and they change its name all the time. Um, this is a similarity that I came to later. I, for many years I've known that the uh, White House Communications Agency was a factor in the Kennedy assassination because we were given, um, as in conjunction with the Warren Commission investigation of JFK, They released the police transcripts and they released uh, certain uh, Secret Service messages. But it was known, and there were two channels of the police, both released. But there was also a third channel that was being used in uh, Daily Plaza. The Secret Service was using the channel of what's called the White House Communications Agency. And uh, for years, I've known we should get that, and we were not able to get that. In 1993, when they set up a review board, I went to the review board and I said they should get those records. They've not been released. The White House, and yet the White House Communications Agency boasts on its website, you can, I imagine, still read it there, that they helped solve the the uh, Kennedy assassination. Well, that's very interesting because their records never reached the Warren Commission, which was supposed to be solving it. And then when the records began to come out about 9-11, this took a couple of years, um, the, we got the 9-11 uh, Commission report, and it turns out that there are certain communications, certain phone calls that we know were made, but there's no record of them. And in my book, The Road to 9-11, I said the evidence points to the suggestion that they were using the, uh, they had already implemented COG. Well, that means, they, in that, if that is the case, they implemented the COG's special communications network, which with change of names is the inheritor of the network. The network and the White House Communications Agency was and still is part of that emergency network. So um, I could say, uh, throw in that another deep event was Iran Contra, and it turned out that Oliver North in 1985-86 was sending arms to Iran, which was illegal, and a lot of people in the government knew nothing about. 
they didn't know about it because Oliver North was in charge of that same emergency network and he used that emergency network to make communications with the embassy in Portugal, for example, in order to facilitate getting those arms to Iran. Uh, so um, that is, for me, a common denial. Oh, and in Watergate, uh, that's another deep event. We still don't know why uh, there was a wiretap put on a phone in the Democratic National Committee. But we do know that James McCord, who was in charge of the team that installed it, was a member of a special Air Force Reserve network that was concerned with uh, continuity of government. So um, this is, uh, and, and he was charged with the same sort of thing, who to round up, the warrantless detention. They had that back in the days of Watergate. So this to me is one of the most striking common denominators through those big four deep events, JFK, Watergate, uh, Iran-Contra, and finally 9-11. And if we ever have another deep event of this kind, I would predict now on the basis of past performance that uh, the emergency network will, will uh, the one in which ordinary people in the government don't have access to, that will be a factor again. Is the Secret Service in both events of special interest? Well, they are of interest precisely because of what we've just been talking about, because they use the White House uh, Communications Agency for their communications. And uh, a lot, the whole books have been written about the Secret Service and the JFK assassination. Uh, um, some very exaggerated. Some people have involved them in the plot. I'm, I, I, I think there was odd malperformance on that day. They didn't do things they should have done. They didn't uh, investigate people they should have. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are culprits, and so I, 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 I'm not subscribing to those theories. Um, it, it's less obvious uh, in the case of 9-11, the Secret Service, but what is, is interesting, they do play a role because uh, at a certain point, there's a, there's a special airplane for continuity of government called the E-4B. They call it the Doomsday Plane, and they call the COG planning the, do, the, doom, uh, the Doomsday um, Program. And uh, this plane flew over the White House. No plane is ever supposed to fly over the White House, and yet on precisely this day where everything went wrong, the E-4B, it's supposed to be the special plane for uh, the National Command Authority, which is the President and the Secretary of Defense. But of course, neither of them were in the plane. One of the President was in Florida, and the Secretary of Defense was in the Pentagon, according to his own account, helping put people on stretchers, which seems an odd thing for him to be doing when the nation's under attack. Um, but the plane was there, and the Secret Service uh, responded by rushing everyone out of the building. This is a very vivid description of how they almost lifted Vice President Cheney out of his chair uh, to rush him out of the building. And of course, to seeing the nation was under attack, it would have been very logical and very sensible for him to get as quickly as he could to the, what we call the PEOC, the emergency bunker that's under the White House for when the nation has to, is under attack. But the interesting thing is uh, he didn't go straight to the PEOC. There were many, many minutes where he waited in the tunnel using a telephone that was there in the tunnel. What would that po telephone possibly be? I would, I would bet money that that was a telephone for it that was connected to the emergency network. And it, I think it was on that phone that a lot of the key decisions were made, not even in the presence of the top advisors who were in the PEOC. So the Secret Service are involved in the sense that it was their mission to get him out, and they uh, were stayed with him while he did 
uh, and with Cheney, while he paused in this tunnel, it, it was maybe as long as 20 minutes, something like that, to make a series of phone calls with both the President and the Secretary of Defense. Related to continuity of government, why is it important to know more about this? And is it still active to this very day? Well, let me begin with the second half. Yes, as far as we know, it is still... Uh, it's very hard to talk about it because no one has ever released a, 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 a word of what these, uh, these uh, special procedures are. We only know about it from what was rele released back in the 1980s. But seeing that what was re talked about in the 1980s is what we've seen implemented since. Warrantless surveillance, we certainly have that. Warrantless detention, we've had that. And uh, martial law, we have now the, the government, per the, the, the military are permanently involved in law enforcement. There is a, an army brigade that is on uh, full-time uh, status in America to deal with any possible disturbances. Um, and uh, sorry, what was the question again? Uh, Why is it important to know more about it? For example, yes, does it mean that the Constitution of the Ni United States, that the Americans are so proud about, is suspended? It, 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 it's not altogether suspended, but it has been uh, supplanted to a large extent. The three things I just described, every one of them is uh, particularly the first two. I mean, we have very clear uh, habeas corpus is mentioned in the, uh, in the Constitution. It isn't exactly guaranteed by the Constitution. It's just taken for granted in the Constitution because it goes back to Magna Carta in the 13th century. It is one of the oldest foundational rights of, com of common law freedoms. And it has been uh, seriously abrogated, not totally suspended, but they, if they want to uh, detain somebody, they will, and they do. And they, not just foreigners, but U.S. citizens. It's, uh, so, yes, it has uh, seriously eroded the status of the Constitution. And, uh, and more and more people are beginning to talk about We're finally getting a serious debate about the warrantless surveillance, which is unconstitutional. And uh, I, the president has said he's going to do something about it, but uh, we haven't seen any results so far. And meanwhile, they're not only trying to prosecute Snowden, who did a public service, I would say, by revealing this, But they are also, they've indicted the, the man who made the, encrypted, the encryption program, which made it possible for him to share documents with Green Mode. And they, they, they've persecuted that man to the point that he's had to uh, dissolve his company. So they're still pretty ruthlessly enforcing this system of secrecy, secret government that has supplanted and become a second layer Uh, overshadowing open government. Regarding 9-11, you say you know only one thing for sure. There has been a massive cover-up. What has been covered up and why? We, we still don't really have a, an explanation why the planes failed to intercept. They should have intercepted. Those are the, certainly by the time of the third and the fourth plane, They should have been intercepted, and there's an elaborate explanation in the 9-11 in the Commission report. But uh, there are many things which are still really inex inexplicable. You know, the behavior of the vice president, who is a key figure in this, um, We, you know, he said, there's, all right, uh, there was a phone call made that implemented uh, COG, that, that is the very center of what happened here. There's no trace of that phone call, not because no trace was made. It wasn't, you know, he didn't do it from a payphone or something. It was certainly done within channels, but I'm sure it was done on a COG line, and uh, we have to hear what was done. This, by the way, has a real uh, legal consequences 
because one of the things to be explained is why the vice president made decisions that he was not legally empowered to make. We, we have a national command authority that governs the military, and that is the president and the secretary of defense. But what seems, uh, as far as we can tell, and the, here the records are missing, so that I would say they're being covered up, is that uh, the actual decisions were made by the vice president, who is not part of the national command authority. All of that should be investigated because it, it is quite possible that crimes were committed in the response to 9-11. I'm not now talking about 9-11 itself, which uh, I do not discuss in my book because there are too many books being written about that. But in the response to 9-11, uh, certain things were done which were not done in the way which is legally prescribed. And that how they were done is being covered up because we don't have the records. Could 9-11 have been prevented? I mean, for example, this is a question that is very crucial uh, for everything that has to do with the NSA. Did the NSA uh, uh, knew nothing about uh, the plans to attack uh, the, uh, the U.S.? Well, of course, we know so little about the NSA that it's difficult for me to say. There are allegations, of course, uh, this Lieutenant Schaffer came forward and said that the DIA, which is the Defense Intelligence Agency, that they, in fact, had very complete files on Mohammed Atta and other... Uh, the, um, the, uh, the Pentagon has denied this. Uh, and then a Congressman Kurt Weldon uh, brought it up in Congress and really wanted to get to the bottom of it. And then the FBI treated him abysmally. They, the FBI leaked the idea that he was an under investigation for some kind of scam that involved his daughter. And the newspapers were full of this. And uh, he was never charged, but he was defeated. They got him out of Congress. So. Um, It was a, a, a sign, which uh, I've talked about this in books, that it, it's very dangerous for congressmen to charge, to challenge that part of the government that I call the deep state, because inevitably, if they do, they get defeated when they come up for re-election. I wrote that before the case of Kurt Weldon, but that was important. Let's talk about the CIA. The CIA definitely knew about two of the hijackers that they were in this alleged hijackers i always say because i don't really know what their role was on 9-11 but i i think it's probable they got on the planes i just cannot believe that they were able to steer the planes into buildings that was some other power that done uh, from outside the plane Uh, and that's uh, technology is totally feasible in the 21st century. Yeah. Uh, but these, if, if those two hijackers, the CIA should have told the FBI, and they didn't. And uh, they were able to move around, be in touch with other hijackers. Now, if if procedures had been followed. The CIA would have notified the FBI, the FBI would have put them under surveillance, and from those two they would have known about uh, virtually all of the hijackers. And uh, so the fact that the CIA did not communicate something that it should have communicated is one of the causes for 9-11 happening the way it did. It's, uh, it's only a part of the big picture, but it's a telltale part, and you had similar failures of communication in the case of John F. Kennedy. That's another of the many similarities that the, um, the, uh, the CIA sent a cable to the FBI, not a cable, it's a, a, um, it's a message. They sent a message to the FBI about Lee Harvey Oswald, and they suppressed the information in it, which would have led to Lee Harvey Oswald being put under surveillance. And if he'd been put under surveillance, he couldn't have played the role that he did in the becoming the designated culprit for the Kennedy assassination. 
So in that sense, I think it's very, very significant that the CIA withheld that. Whether, um, because I don't really, und I don't claim to know who made 9-11 happen, and unlike many people, I am not saying that the White House made it happen. No, I think somebody in the deep state made it happen, but you see, we, in my notion of the deep state, there are elements of it that aren't even in the government. So uh, to say that the deep state did something is, it doesn't really tell us very much. Uh, but um, the, uh, we, we need to know more. And uh, there, there are records buried still that could be released that would help us to understand these things. Now, let's say if rogue elements of the gov government were involved in 9-11. People say that someone would have surely talked by now. You know, you can't keep a secret in Washington. What's your take on this? Well, you know, there is actually a book about the Kennedy assassination, and its title is Someone Would Have Talked, because, of course, they said that from the very beginning about the Kennedy assassination. And um, the, the answer in the book is many people talked, Uh, but they don't get heard. And uh, with 9-11, too, I was just talking about 9-11 last night, and there was somebody uh, who was prepared to swear on a Bible that the last plane, Flight 93, was maybe uh, hit, uh, injured over Shanksville, and part of it went down over Shanksville, but it, that it continued because he... Uh, I have a friend who talked to a very close friend of his, who talked to a very close friend of his, who says he saw a missile hit Flight 93 over Camp David, where the president's uh, hideaway in the mountains. And that's not in the papers. It's not because the man didn't talk. It's because he talked and the FBI came to him and said, you must never talk about that again. It actually was in the media. There, were, there is, I just looked at it, uh, a TV report from the time about the, 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 uh, the FBI was saying that a plane had been shot down over Camp David, and uh, they got this information from the FAA. All of that was on TV, but it was got taken off TV, and the nation has forgotten about it, or nearly all of the nation has forgotten about it. The E4B over the White House, CNN re reported that on TV. It's a very important part of the story, but then they took it down. Luckily, somebody had recorded it, and they put it back up on YouTube. And if you buy my book when it comes out in November, you'll see a, a URL to watch video of the plane over the White House. The Air Force denied it ever happened, but it clearly did. It's clearly an EF, E4B, and so people have come forward with, ex other, other people have come forward with explanations. The thing is, information is always controlled in any society, and if uh, somebody says something that doesn't fit an official story, um, We, we are a pretty open society in America, so they do get to say it, it just doesn't get to be heard. Related to the question if someone has talked about 9-11 and that there might have happened something else than the public was told, uh, is significant in the case of Sybil Edmonds. Uh, can you talk about her case a little bit? Yes, well... Um, Sybil Edmonds was a translator working for the FBI, and uh, she saw things uh, in the, she, she, her languages were Turkish and I think Far Farsi from Iran. And um, she saw, th the FBI were investigating people, but because the agents were not Farsi speakers, they needed her to translate these communications they had. And what she saw was so alarming that she uh, tried to bring it to the attention of her superiors. It's, it's a long time since I've looked at her case, but essentially she was told to shut up. And eventually she was um, under a court order, I believe. And uh, to this day, uh, she doesn't want to go to jail. So uh, she talks about many other things, but she will not fully share what it was. Um, 
that she saw, except she's given us strong indications that people very high in the government were involved in uh, improper activities with other governments, and uh, she's named those governments, the Turkish government being one of them. And uh, she she's an example, and not the only example, of somebody who's... Uh, uh, she she cannot talk in this free society that we have. The official version of 9-11 is based in very large parts on torture testimony. Does this make the story pretty much worthless? And furthermore, is this something that too many people are ignorant of? Uh, the part, the 9-11 commission report that it's only one small part of the report, but it's the part that is talking about what Al-Qaeda did, how they planned it, and so on. Yes, that is all from tortured testimony, from people who were being tortured before they gave this t testimony. Some of those witnesses now no longer in custody and recanted what they said. Uh, they, uh, they they put in about one person, Abu Zubaida. Uh, he he confessed to being a part of the Al Qaeda thing, and 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 he wasn't at all. It was a total mis uh, misguided direction. Um, so I think all of that testimony should be thrown out. That wouldn't invalidate the whole of the 9/11 Commission report. But uh, certain chapters of it, which are talking about what Al-Qaeda did, yes, are, are, are not to be uh, taken very seriously because of their alliance. By the way, uh, you know, the 9-11 Commission wanted to see the transcripts. We're not allowed to see the transcripts. Right away that becomes very suspicious. They were not told that the people were tortured. And since then, I think both of the co-chairmen, uh, Thomas Kane and um, <laughs> Hamilton, um, have complained that they were actually misled by the CIA. And uh, so that the, 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 it's, it's in a bit of a shambles, the official version that's in the 9-11 Commission report. It's been discounted even by the co-chairman of the uh, of the commission. Um, so, but yes, the fact that tor that they used torture to obtain testimony was should not have happened in the first place. It should not have been used in the second place. They should have been candid about the circumstances, and they weren't in the third places. So, in every way, it it is a disgrace. Do you think the hegemony of the U.S. in the world declined because of the action that followed 9-11? With, for example, it seems uh, as if the true beneficiaries of the uh, war on terror are China and Russia. Well, let's, let's go at that bit by bit. Um, one of the major consequences of 9-11 of was the invasion of Iraq. And I, I think there is almost no one who everyone would agree that American power in the world, and particularly in the Middle East, has been eroded because of the invasion of Iraq. It has resulted in, uh, first of all, in the election, if you want democracy for Iraq, then the majority are going to rule and the majority are Shia, so you now have a Shia government in Iraq. And uh, it is much more friendly to Iran than it is to the United States. Uh, many people could have and did predict this. It's not, it's not rocket science. It's pretty obvious. That also has led to major uh, tensions between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, historically, whether this should be or not, it can be debated, but historically it has been the strongest ally of the United States in that region. And now there are many major differences because uh, Saudi Arabia were delighted to see uh, Saddam Hussein go, but they didn't want an invasion because they knew it would destabilize Iraq and create the, this, uh, this uh, status of, a, of a, I don't want to say a failed state, I don't like that phrase, but uh, a very weakened authority in Iraq, which is very dangerous to Saudi Arabia. They have every reason 
uh, legitimately to be upset at what America did in Iraq, and so that weakens America's relationship to Saudi Arabia. You have um, Saudi, in the whole of the Middle East now, um, uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski called it an arc of crisis back about 19... Uh, 78 or 79, it's much more an arc of crisis now than it was then as a result of, uh, you, you know, I think that the invasion of Afghanistan was also misguided, but it, it's much more defensible uh, than the invasion of Iraq, and the two of them have uh, grossly expanded Let's not talk about Al-Qaeda, but let's talk about al Qaedaist forces, people who do similar things to Al-Qaeda, and there are many groups now, uh, and uh, many of them are actually based in Iraq as a result of America's invasion of Iraq. And this is spreading into Africa. Uh, so I'm not sure that the beneficiaries are really so much Russia and China as lawlessness. I think Russia, China, and America all have common interests in not seeing terrorists. And I think Russia has been uh, made it very clear that they would like to collaborate with the United States uh, in dealing with terrorism. And uh, there are times when uh, particularly Obama seemed as if he was going to uh, do more in common with Russia, particularly in Syria, for example, where al Qaedaist elements are a major part of the problem now for both Russia and America. Uh, and then we suddenly get the Ukraine. Even the Ukraine, you could really blame in a way on the what's happened since 9-11. That might take more time than we can do in our hour here, but... Uh, the deterioration of uh, understanding between uh, Russia and America, which um, Afghanistan is part of that, it, it, these are all complicated things. But uh, one thing that is so clear is that the Iraq thing was a disaster and it's created tensions uh, and uh, if we don't learn how to deal with these tensions, we are closer to the risk of nuclear war today than we have been for 20 or 30 years. And that, that is a very alarming situation. Uh, related to the Iraq war, has the peace movement around the globe failed post 9-11 for it protested, for example, against the war in Iraq? But without questioning the root of all evil, the official 9-11 narrative as the pretext and justification to go to war. It, it certainly, it would have been a more powerful uh, protest movement against the idea of war in Iraq if we had understood uh, what happened on 9-11. Uh, I don't think that it, it's realistic to think that we could have known enough uh, at the time of, uh, you know, the America went in in 2003 and we didn't even get the 9-11 Commission report until 2004. So I don't think it ever could have helped the anti-war movement in, uh, in 2003, but it certainly could help future uh, such movements. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen in the Ukraine, but, um, well, I know, actually, I think I do know now. I think Europe is intervening to stop uh, America from making a complete fool of itself. I cannot believe with some of the things that John Kerry has said uh, recently. I mean, when he, for example, said to uh, Putin after Crimea, we don't do that sort of thing in the 21st century when America has been the most conspicuous and flagrant uh, uh, beha be uh, example of that kind of behavior. Um, so I think it's people not in government have to mobilize around the world and create a kind of global public opinion that can check, uh, I don't want to say just America, but America and other governments when they start uh, doing excessive things 
it used to be the case that governments didn't worry about public opinion and that was bad and now we're beginning to develop a public opinion which can constrain governments and it has on time on occasion and that's good i think public opinion for example it was a major factor in persuading American corporations not to invest in South Africa. And that divestiture movement, which was public opinion, uh, was a major factor. Nelson Mandela has said as much, or a major factor, in the liberation of South Africa. So there have been um, public opinion in the end is what ended uh, segregation in the southern United States. So there is there is possibly, it wasn't successful in Iraq, but uh, it, it, you shouldn't think, could draw the conclusion from a single failure that these things are not worth doing. They are. Do you have any hope that the question, what did actually happen on 9-11, will ever be seriously addressed in the future? Well, if, if you mean addressed by the U.S. government, perhaps not. But it is already seriously addressed by people who have devoted their lives to it. I don't count myself in that number, but there are such people. I think they have made uh, very significant discoveries. I think the amount of um, the fact that there was um, uh, explosive materials has been pretty well established in Building 7 and uh, both the towers. Uh, there was a government investigation of why the towers went down by it's called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and so on uh, and NIST was forced to revise its findings, you know, they said the building building 7 came down in 5.3 seconds and the critics were saying well, part of that time was free fall and they, and they just simply said from the 5.3 seconds that's not free fall so they asked for a clearer definition of what they meant, and they produced a graph which showed that, in fact, yes, for two or three seconds in the middle, the building was in free fall. Well, if the building was in free fall, it must have had some kind of explosions to clear away the path of the top of the building to descend. It's as clear as that. So I think we have made significant progress. You can talk about that as serious. When, when you get the government to admit that, well, you know, they, it's 2014 and there has not been a, a, a reconsideration of the Warren Commission, but almost everybody in America knows that the Warren Commission is not the answer. So um, public, in public opinion, I think there will be more and more serious investigation. Yeah, but and that's what really matters. But from the international community, that there's um, some pressure on the U.S. to get clean, you don't think that this will ever happen? I'm a former diplomat. I don't think that's the way governments talk to governments, no. And, and, and I'm not sure they should. They, they, they have to deal with their, their narrow interests. What we need to see is people in the world exerting that kind of pressure, newspapers exerting that kind of pressure. And uh, it's lucky that uh, we have other countries that speak English besides the United States, so that, for example, the British press have given a much better account of what uh, Glenn Greenwald has uh, got from Edward Snowden. And in general, uh, I think uh, if an American wants to know what's happening in his country, he should read The Guardian in London, and he can read it online, so he has no excuse not to. Um, that is the sort of thing that may res restore a degree of sanity to a world when we, uh, I have to say, America is a wonderful country. I love living here. It has a government which you ultimately have to say is behaving insanely. The invasion of Iraq was insane. There were any number of experts who said this is going to work out badly. And when they said that Saddam Hussein had uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, the evidence was discredited before, and so discredited that they couldn't even use it the way they really had wanted to use it. Um, those kind of pressures from public opinion 
are what we need to bring the American government back to sanity. And uh, how do you judge upon the fact that there was no um, that there was no punishment for this uh, lying about the Iraq war? Um, we can get into details about this. You know, in my American War Machine, I show how a, a private corporation conducted intelligence on whether he had weapons of mass destruction or not. And they concluded that he did. SAIC is the name of the corporation. And then they decided afterwards, when it turned out that they hadn't, they said, we better find out how we could have been so wrong. And who did they charge to find out what went wrong? The same corporation, SAIC. Um, I've, I'm sort of like Bishop Tutu in South Africa. I think we need truth and reconciliation. Um, that's more important right now than to send people to jail. We need the truth so urgently. I would be willing to forego putting people in prison if we could get the truth. Because if we got the truth, that would certainly force, uh, for example, ending the state of emergency that still exists in this country, renewed by Obama without discussion. Every year, once a year, it has to be renewed. Uh, then Congress would do what it's supposed to do, look at the state of emergency, would make, look at continuity of government. The more the truth came out about these things, the more we would return to America as it used to be, which was very, very far from an ideal condition, but very, very much better than what we have in America today. Are Wall Street interests at the very heart of the deep state? Yes, the way in my book, I, the, you, the, the, the initial notion of the deep state is the public institutions and then overshadowed by NSA, CIA, JSOC and the Pentagon, all these new secret institutions. And that's your first level of the deep state. But these people, agencies are powerful because they have connections outside the government. They don't just report up to uh, the president, but they are also, particularly the CIA, it's, it's easy to document, is very rooted in Wall Street. And it was like largely designed by Alan Dulles when he was still a Wall Street lawyer before he actually entered the CIA. And it, the CIA is as powerful as it is because of its connections to Wall Street. And it used to be almost the same thing, its connections to big oil, because the big oil companies used to be based in New York and they were uh, put together by um, Wall Street and they operated as a cartel and that was defended successfully by Sullivan and Cromwell, which was a Wall Street, a Wall Street law firm that not accidentally John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles were senior members of. Yes, the, um, the Wall Street is important. It was then. It's historically easy to show in the 1950s, and I do in my book. It's harder to show in the present, but uh, there are many indications, I think. Oh, for one thing is the deep state, I, we should mention, is going more and more multinational as the corporations go multinational. Exxon is a multinational firm, and there are some U.S. firms, no, notably Blackwater, which is this kind of private army that turns up um, in various places. Uh, Germany is saying, I believe you have, in Germany, your press has said that Blackwater or a subsidiary of Blackwater is operating in Ukraine. Yes, this well, we call it an American corporation, but now technically their headquarters is in Qatar, in the Persian Gulf. So uh, you cannot control it. How is Washington going to control a, a corporation whose headquarters are in the Persian Gulf? You're getting the apparatus of a super, supranational deep state um, and we were going to need to develop institutions on a supranational level that can deal with these new kinds of institutions that whose business is to stir up unrest because it's profitable. Two personal questions at the very end. 
How do you deal with it that you get dismissed as a conspiracy theorist from time to time? And how do you deal with the sadness that must surely be a follower of yours given your oeuvre? I mean, so when, was, I, mean when I read your, your, your stuff, I get super depressed. And so I would like to know what's with you. I mean, you are the one who writes this, right? And who has yes. to cope with the truth. And how you deal with it? Well, I've got to learn to do, expect less and less in my lifetime. Um, I am, uh, first of all, call me a conspiracy theorist. It's almost a badge of honor the way the, the you know, the people who are using the phrase, they lump me in with people who believe in uh, extraterrestrials and so on. Uh, I guess they, if, if they refute me by talking about extraterrestrials, that's a sign that they don't want to deal with what I'm actually saying which I suppose is a kind of negative compliment. Um, I had trouble hearing you, but if you asked how I deal psychologically with uh, not being heard and uh, so on, um, it's, been, it's been difficult at times in my life. In fact, uh, back around 1980, I was supposed to have a book come out a quarter of a million copies, first printing about the Kennedy assassination, and then my publisher suppressed it. And uh, I took that very hard. I went into a kind of depression. But it was the luckiest thing that ever happened to me, because out of that depression, I started writing a poem called Coming to Jakarta. And that poem deals with depression, and deals with terror, and deals with all the things that were really upsetting me. and. Um, my, my other book that didn't get published is not nearly as important to me as coming to Jakarta, which was the result of the suppression. So I feel I was, in a sense, a lucky guy. And in my, I have a very lovely second marriage, and I feel um, sustained. M meeting people like you, Lars, in Germany. I, I know somebody in Moscow now. I have my French translator, Maxime Cher. These are all wonderful people that I'm so privileged to know and work with. And because I've always believed that uh, the task for my generation was to lay the foundations of a global public opinion, a global civil society. And I think I see that happening. I don't feel depressed. I think that uh, it's very fragile because it depends on the internet and the internet is a gift that can be taken away very easily by those in power and occasionally is. Actually, my website on, uh, on Facebook was suppressed at a certain point. I don't know why, I think probably accidentally because they really wanted to get someone else. Um, so it's fragile, but it's working. And if it were to be suppressed, then something else would bring it. I do believe, I believe in the goodness of the human species. And um, I also believe that we've had bad governments from the beginning of time. And, uh, and we haven't made, you know, we've made progress in some respects, but we've also made the opposite of progress in some respects because the risks of the human race destroying itself are obviously greater today than they were a hundred years ago, so that's not such great progress. Um, but uh, I, uh, I uh, in my poetry, I, I, I talk about what an idiot I am to write about politics, and sometimes I think I am an idiot, but I enjoy it, and I enjoy talking to you, so uh, that's why I keep going. Okay, thank you very much for this conversation.